to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In the midst of His suffering and agony on the cross, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark chapter 15, verse number 34. We welcome you to our series of lessons, More About Jesus. Every one of us who loves the Lord, who wants to follow the Bible and believes in the New Testament, indeed wants to know more about Jesus and wants to pattern His life after the life of the Savior. Today, in our series of lessons, we think about the seven statements that Jesus made on the cross and how those statements impact and change world history, but not only that, change our lives and motivate us to be greater followers of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're joining our broadcast for the very first time, we welcome you to today's lesson, which is brought to you by members of the Church of Christ Worldwide. Those members of the Lord's Church would love for you to stop by in your local area and visit the Church of Christ. If you've never been to their assembly, you'd be a welcome guest in so doing. Also, if you'd like to have a Bible study with them or learn more about God's Word and what the Scriptures teach about God's church and the plan of salvation, they'd be happy to sit down with you, just open up the Bible and study just the Word of God with you. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in knowing God's Word and coming to a better understanding of His will in any way that we can. We encourage you to visit our website thegospelofchrist.com where we have a variety of Bible study materials whether it be DVD or CD or study courses you'd like to be involved in or written material that you'd like to learn from. All of those are available free of charge on our website and if you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons or, or any of our lessons on DVD or CD We'd love to send those to you or you can access those 24-7 on the website in both video and audio format. And if you've got a Bible study question, we always encourage our viewers, if you've got a question, if you'd like to ask something related to the Bible or like to study something further that we can help you with, please don't hesitate to call or email us at the information given at the end of this broadcast and we'd love to help you in any way that we can. Today we study those great statements, the seven statements that Jesus took time to make on the cross. And we say it in that way because every breath that the Lord took on the cross was no doubt a breath of suffering and agony. And to breathe and say those things had to mean they were very, very important to say. Imagine in your mind, if you will, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, his hands are nailed, his feet are nailed to the cross, and to exhale, to inhale, Jesus has to put pressure on his feet. To exhale, as he does that, the, the nails in his ankles or in his feet hurt. To exhale, Jesus has to put pressure on his hands. And so, friend, with every breath the Lord took, it was indeed a breath of agony and pain and suffering. Therefore, the things he said on the cross had to be extremely important and essential for Christians and something that God desperately wanted us to have. Well, what did Jesus take time to say on the cross? We begin with the words of Luke chapter 23, verse number 34. As Jesus taught us probably one of the most masterful lessons about forgiveness you could ever imagine. The scripture records, then Jesus said, while He was on the cross, looking down at all the people who had likely put Him there, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided His garments and cast lots, as was the fulfillment of Scripture. But I want you to think about what Jesus has just endured. 
He came into the world to save people from sin. He went about doing good and preaching the gospel. He didn't do evil. He didn't uh, degrade people. He healed the sick. He helped the poor. He fed those who were hungry. He cast out demons from those who were afflicted. And for all of that, what did they say? Crucify Him! The mob cried out. And yet they took Jesus. They beat Him. They mocked Him. They twisted a crown of thorns, embedded it into his skull. They beat him on the head with a rod. They took him and bound him with his back tied. And over and over again, they scourged the Lord and Savior. And then they took him up that, to that place of the skull, to Golgotha, Calvary. And they nailed his hands and feet to a cross. And he hung there in agony. And yet, the love of Christ, the master of forgiveness had the word, the, the, the heart, the attitude, and the mindset to say to the very people who had done that, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, you put yourself in that situation. You think if somebody had tortured you, if somebody had beat you, if those things had occurred in your life, and you're there on the cross, what would you be thinking? I might be thinking about those legions of angels that could indeed come down at that moment and wreak violence and destruction on all those who had done that. We might be thinking about, oh, pity and why and how bad it is for me. We might be thinking how bad we've got it. We might be thinking, why did God let this happen? We might be thinking of a host of other things. What was Jesus thinking on the cross? He stayed true to His mission. He came to seek and save the lost, Matthew 1, 21. He came to bring God's plan of salvation. And friend, that plan of salvation was available to all men, even those who put Him on the cross. And so as I think about the statements of Jesus, you can't help but see Jesus as the master of forgiveness. Now, practically speaking, how does that apply to me and you? Well, here's the application. Let's say that in our lives, there's somebody who wrongs us. Let's say there's somebody who does harm to us, does evil to us, does something that they shouldn't do to us. What should be our attitude? To forgive them. If they repent, if He repents, forgive Him. Luke chapter 17, verse number 3. Jesus gave the illustration in the Sermon on the Mount. If you're at the altar and you find that you've got fault with your brother, what do you do? You leave your gift at the altar, you go make it right with your brother. Friend, the idea of forgiveness is not only something that God extends to us, it's something we ought to extend to others. You know, too many times we hold grudges, we get angry, we get all worked up, and, and it is as though we want people to get what's coming to them. Not Jesus. If men would have got what was coming to them, Jesus indeed had the power to do that. But instead He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Reminiscent of the words of, uh, of Stephen as he's being stoned, he looked up to heaven and said much of the same in Acts chapter 7. And friend, our attitude always needs to be an attitude of love and forgiveness and hope that people will turn to God. On the cross, one of the great statements Jesus also makes, and it expresses Jesus' love for the lost, is found in Luke chapter 23, verse number 43. There were two thieves on the cross. At one time, they both reviled the Lord and Savior. The gospel accounts record for us. But then one of them had a change of heart. And he turned to the Lord and he realized he was a just man, that he had done wrong, and he's now pleading for his eternal soul. Nobody comes down from a cross. He knows that. He's talking about matters in the future. He looks for forgiveness. He looks for hope. And here's what Jesus said in Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said to that thief, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Look at the love of Jesus even on the cross. Jesus is saving souls, pointing to people toward God, and fulfilling His mission in which He came to seek and save the lost. This penitent thief who has now come to terms with his own demise is facing eternity square in reality comes to Jesus, penitent heart, ready to change. Jesus says, you've made the right choice. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, there's a great lesson learned here, and it indeed is the love of the Savior for the lost. Don't, don't miss the point. Jesus 
wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, the Scripture clearly records, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, the Bible says that God's not slow concerning His slowness or slack concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This man, under the age in which he was living, came to Jesus, expressed his faith, a desire to change, and Jesus had the power on earth to save him. And so what wonderful love the Savior had for the lost. But now, friend, as we think about this statement, let me mention that oftentimes this thief is used in a context and in a manner which is not in accord with the Scripture's teaching on salvation. Many times as we talk with people about the New Testament plan of salvation, which Jesus clearly taught to be saved, you've got to believe in Him. John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Uh, Jesus clearly taught in the Scriptures that you have to change your life. Luke 13, verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. The Lord ever so plainly said that one must confess Him as Savior. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, If you won't confess Me before the Father, for men, neither will I confess you before the Father. And friend, Christ made it so plain that to be saved in the New Testament age, one must be baptized for the remission of sins. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. What did Jesus say you got to do to be saved? Believe and be baptized. Not the first time He said that. John 3, verse 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So to be saved, to go to heaven, Jesus said you got to be baptized. Now, that's clear, that's plain, that's pretty simple language. But oftentimes, when people object to that, they try to bring up the wonderful example of the Lord's love for the thief on the cross as an example that all you got to do is believe. Now, friend, the thief is not a, an example of salvation today for the following reasons. Number one, I don't know for sure that the thief wasn't baptized. The Bible says all the regions of Jerusalem, Judea, and all the regions round about went out to be baptized. Where was the thief crucified at? In Jerusalem. Well, how do you know he wasn't baptized? I don't, nor do you. Someone says, well, the thief was never baptized. The thief was saved. Therefore, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Wait a minute now. To prove that theory, you've got to prove the thief was never baptized. Did you know that's unprovable? Therefore, that syllogism falls flat on its face in the very first part of it. Secondly, the thief is not a good example that a person doesn't have to be baptized to be saved because he's living under the Old Testament, not the New. Friend, the thief cannot be an example of New Testament salvation. He died prior to New Testament Christianity and the gospel being opened up to the Jews even. Acts chapter 2, for the very first time, the gospel is preached and men and women are told how to be saved in the New Testament age. What about at the Old Testament? Am I going to be saved like David, Noah? Uh, am I going to be saved like Solomon? Am I going to be saved like others? No, those are Old Testament examples. I'm not going to be saved like David. I'm not going to be saved like Noah and build an ark. What age did that thief live and die under? Friend, he lived and died under the Old Testament. The Old Testament has been nailed to the cross. Colossians 2 verse 14 clearly teaches, and therefore, if anything, he would be an example of Jesus' power to save while he was on earth under the Old Testament age, but we now have God's full revealed will under the New Testament age, and we know exactly what Christ expects of us today. And so from Acts 2 forward, Anyone who obeys the gospel must do that according to the Lord's teaching. Now, with that in mind, let's then look at the third statement Jesus made on the cross. Jesus here, now with one of His last statements, expresses His great love for His family. John 19, verse 26, When Jesus therefore saw His mother and the disciple whom He loved, John, standing by, He said to His mother, Woman, behold your son. He said to John, Son, behold your mother. When we think about Christ, even up to His very last breath, He was making sure His mother was taken care of. 
family, especially those a part of God's family, were indeed a priority for Christ. Why, why was that so? Because God commanded it. Do you remember one of the commandments on the old law? Honor your father and mother all the days of your life. Did Jesus not do that right up to the end? And so as we think practically from this statement, which indeed was an important one, we learn the importance of family. We learn the importance of children obeying their parents, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Parents bringing up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We see the significance of, of parents taking care of children in, John, uh, or in Mary and John, uh, of children taking care of their parents, and making sure especially in the family of God that we put one another above all else. Mark 3.35, Jesus is at, His brothers and His mother come to Him and the crowd says, Lord, do you not care that your mother and brother are asking for you? And Jesus looked around in the crowd and said to those who heard His word and followed Him, these are my mother and my brother and my sisters, whoever does the will of God. That's our real family. And so we see the prime importance in Jesus' statement of family in one's life. Then Jesus also made this statement, the one that we began with, Mark chapter 15, verse number 34. As Jesus is on the cross, and as His time is drawing near, Jesus at the ninth hour cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What do I learn from this statement about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? You know, some of the greatest ways that I learn, that you learn, that people around the world learn is by question. Jesus asked a question, I believe, to teach us. Why did God the Father forsake His Son for a period of time on the cross? Well, again, I don't have to look far for that answer. Do you remember the words of 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21? The Scripture says, God made Christ, listen now, who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And so 2 Corinthians 5.21, Christ became that sin offering. He took the world's sin upon Him. Do you remember 1 Peter 2.24? He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. And so when Jesus asked that question, God, why have you forsaken me? He knew the answer. The answer reminds us of our own sin that Christ bore. God made Him a sin offering, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He bore our sins in His own body. And, and as you remember, the Scripture records, sin separates one from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 says, God is of pure eyes than to behold evil and cannot look upon wickedness. If Christ bore the sins of the world and became that, that perfect sin offering, that propitiation for sin, no sin of His own, but willingly became that scapegoat for sin. And then my friend, God had to, for a short period of time, look away as that sin was taken by the Savior and while redemption was made and sacrifice became available for us today. And so, what do I learn from this? Friend, I want you to think about, you know, sometimes I don't realize, think we realize this. Do we realize what that took and what it meant? I believe one of the greatest things Jesus suffered on the cross was not the agony and the pain of the physical suffering, but the momentary separation from God. Why is that? John 17, verse 3, Jesus prayed to the Father, Restore to me that which we had from eternity. How long had the Father and Son had that closeness, been one, never been separate? For, for eternity. They'd always known that communion, that fellowship, that closeness, and then Jesus willingly allowed Himself to be separated from that. As a parent, maybe you can understand. You ever been somewhere and lost a child? Maybe just momentarily. Maybe you're in Walmart, maybe you're at a, a theme park, maybe you're at a zoo or somewhere, and your child just slipped away for a second, and can you can you feel that sense of loss? Can you feel that nagging sense of this can't be happening? The loneliness that's there. Can you imagine how the Father and the Son must have felt when Christ said those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then let's realize the answer to that question. When Jesus asked, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I need look no further than the mirror for the answer. I'm the answer 
and you're the answer. He bore our sins in His own body upon the tree. What a powerful teaching of Christ and His willingness to bear sin and really become the world's greatest sacrifice. And then as we think about some of the statements made by Jesus on the cross, we now move toward one of the statements that teaches us about the humanity of Christ. Let's realize this. Jesus is indeed a relatable Savior because He faced the things that I'll have to face as well. He suffered, He hurt, He agonized, He faced discouragement just like we face. Hebrews 4.15 He was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. Now here's one of the proofs of that. In one of His statements on the cross, Jesus in John 19.28 said, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. On the cross, Jesus became thirsty. As the body was leaving Him, as the body was winding down, as, as the blood was no doubt letting out, as His physical hurt was indeed mounting up, the thirst which one would naturally have in times like those overtook Him, no doubt. And Jesus cried out, I thirst. Of course, they gave Him sour wine, a sour wine mingle of vinegar, and He tasted that and didn't drink it, but nonetheless, you see here the humanity of Christ. Now friend, I want you to think about this. One of the most beautiful passages I think is found in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. The scripture records, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. Jesus was in heaven. He left heaven, came to this earth, and clothed Himself in humanity, and faced and suffered what I have to face and suffer. Now, Philippians 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery made equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, coming in the likeness of man. He humbled himself. God, who saves me from sin and saves you from sin, came in human form. He really suffered. He really hurt. He really became thirsty on the cross. And why did He do all that? Because He wanted to save His people from sin and Satan and all that goes along with that. Now, we also mention, as we think about the ultimate statements on the cross, this would be right up at the top. As Jesus is now drawing nigh to His death, we see that statement He makes about His fulfillment and the great completion of God's will. Listen to the words of John 19 verse 30. So when Jesus had received that sour wine, He said, I thirst. They gave Him sour wine, mingle of vinegar. When He received that sour wine, He said, It is finished. And bowing His head, He gave up His spirit. Can you imagine what the Lord had to go through in saying that? This had been planned from eternity. As we said, Genesis chapter 3, 15, Genesis 22, 18, uh, Genesis 49, 10, all the references in Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. This has been planned from eternity. This was His mission. This was His purpose. Jesus said, I came to do the will of the Father. Can't you sense the joy and the fulfillment in Jesus' voice? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Jesus, for the joy set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. What was that joy? The completion of God's plan, the fulfillment of it, was that joy. Now, you can think of that in earthly terms. Let's say you've got a project. Let's say you've got something you're doing. You're looking forward to that. It's your mission, your own task. You've been working on it for a period of time, and you get to the last point where maybe you're driving that last nail in, you're finishing the last part on that project, and it's completed. Isn't there a sense of joy and completion in that? Can you imagine then, in the mind of Christ, as this is what God's ultimate plan from eternity has been, He could say with such joy and fulfillment, it's finished. We've done it. Satan has been defeated. The world now has opportunity to salvation. The church could be established. Uh, forgiveness could be a reality. People could now be brought back together with God, live with Him in heaven, and Satan is ultimately going to be defeated through all this. Look at what Christ did, what God did, and how He went to the greatest lengths to make sure we could be saved. Now, that final statement. 
made on the cross expresses along with that statement, it is finished, the absolute submission of our Lord and Savior. Listen to the words of Jesus as everything draws to a, an end in His life in Luke 23 verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Your hands I commit My spirit. Having said this, He breathed His last. All the way to the end, Jesus was submissive to the Father. Now friend, as I think about this great statement, what a practical application there is for me and you. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 says, Jesus is the author of salvation to all who obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus clearly teaches us that whoever humbles himself under the mighty hand of God, he's going to be exalted in the last day. When Jesus said in Matthew 26 in the garden, not my will but yours be done, here's the ultimate fulfillment of that. He went to the cross, he died, and he said, Father, my spirit's now in your hands. I'm committing it to you. I need that type of submissive, humble, contrite attitude to really please God. If I'm going to do what God wants me to do, I need the submission to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. And Christ answers that question. He wants us to believe with all our heart He is the Christ. John 8, 24. He wants us to make changes in our life where necessary. Luke 13, verse 3. He wants us to acknowledge before the world Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Acts 8, verse 37 through 39. And Christ wants us to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins so that the Lord can add us to His church, Acts 2, verse 38 and Acts 2, verse 47. Friend, as we think about everything that the Lord did for us, everything He, he gave up, everything He suffered, the natural question becomes, am I willing to give up? Am I willing to sacrifice? Am I willing to submit to follow Jesus? We urge you today, if your life is not in line with the will of God, won't you submit to the Lord and please join us again as we study more about Jesus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. With his bride, this this is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.